Jesus and the Kingdom of God. As we begin this look at the Kingdom of God or Kingdom of Heaven in Jesus' teaching, I'd just like to point out a few resources. Now there are numerous resources, and so these aren't the top three necessarily, but these are just a few that I uh, thought I'd bring to your attention. First of all, George Beasley Murray. George Beasley Murray uh, was a well-known New Testament scholar in evangelical circles um, and uh, also in the Baptist world. Uh, his book, Jesus and the Kingdom of God, explores the roots of the concept of the kingdom as well as looks at uh, Jesus' teaching on the kingdom. Uh, it's uh, a scholarly work, uh, certainly readable, but it uh, is one of the more advanced sorts of resources that you might use. It's also dated a bit, 1986. I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, Karagunis, on the other hand, has an article in uh, the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels on Kingdom of God. Uh, this Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels and the other dictionaries that have been produced by InterVarsity Press are simply excellent. They uh, should be used regularly in your uh, studies. Uh, this, so an article like this can provide you an overview of the different camps that there are and different views on a subject. It will give you a very brief uh, bibliography at the end to orient you to further research. Uh, it will mention some of the, quote, big names, we might say, in the discussion of a certain topic. And uh, it will give you a little bit of the author's own perspective as to um, how to understand a, uh, one of the concepts. So over against Beasley Murray, you can have something like Karagunis that will give you good guidance at the beginning of your studies on a subject. Now, I mentioned Brent Petra as an example of a third type of literature that can be quite helpful. Notice the date here, 2005. Something happened around about the 19, early 1990s where New Testament scholars began to pay more attention to um, the uh, concept of a new exile. I'm sorry, a new exodus. Um, We've talked about this a bit in the lecture on Jesus and John the Baptist. A new <clears throat> Exodus motif, particularly in Isaiah 40 and following, but other parts of the prophets as well, that what God was going to do was take Israel out of the foreign lands to which it had been thrown, uh, just as it had in many years past brought Israel out of exile from Egypt. This notion of uh, a restoration from exile or new exodus um, becomes part of the prophet's eschatology, that is their teachings on the end times. So the day of the Lord language uh, from the prophets gets to be associated with this return from exile as well. Day of the Lord can be an expression used in various ways, not just one. So I'm saying one of the ways in which it's used is in terms of Israel being restored from captivity. So since around about 1990, scholars have been pointing to this uh, narrative substructure for reading the New Testament in very fruitful ways, I would argue. So Brent Petra's book is called Jesus, the Tribulation and the End of, Ex of the Exile, Restoration Eschatology, and the origin of the atonement. So there are lots of concepts involved here, um, but it is an example of a book that is picking up on this narrative substructure of the, uh, the New Exodus. Restoration eschatology is his term here. My presentation on Kingdom of God is going to focus on those passages that are behind our New Testament texts, behind the Gospels, behind Jesus' teaching, behind John the Baptist teaching, that are found in the prophets, uh, the, the passages that refer to the return from exile of Israel.
So uh, the passages that we'll focus on are very familiar passages uh, to uh, Christians. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Perhaps not as often focused on, but uh, I would argue is a, a very important passage, and that is Isaiah 59, 20 to 21. Notice that they say very similar things as they describe Israel coming out of exile. We, here we find the language in Jeremiah of new covenant, of God giving the people a heart, uh, and uh, he talks about my law. Uh, just focusing on that last phrase, my law, in Ezekiel, it's my statutes. In Isaiah 59, it's my words. Uh, similarly, in Ezekiel 36, we have a new spirit and also the language of heart. And then in Isaiah 59, there is a redeemer that is coming uh, who uh, will establish a covenant uh, with God's people. So this now is the kind of understanding of what it means uh, in the prophets for Israel to come out of exile. God is going to have to do something different with them. They don't just come out of exile. It's not as if they get out of jail, pure and simple. Uh, but they have been... Uh, not only released, but also made new, transformed by what God is going to do uh, for the people of Israel. It's important that we understand this narrative as a narrative uh, such as the following. Israel goes into exile because of their sin. Israel doesn't go into Egypt because of their sin. They go into exile, though, because of their sin. When Israel comes out of Egypt, Israel comes out of G Egypt as uh, slaves who have been released by God. They are God's people. How dare the Egyptians enslave them? And so the story of the Exodus is a story of release from slavery and God making this people his own th uh, through the law of Moses and then giving them the land and so forth. But the, the sin that Israel experiences in the Exodus is once they come out of Egypt, uh, rather than that they go into exile, into, ex, in, into Egypt because of their sin. It's quite different when we look at the narrative of uh, Israel in Babylon um, or the northern kingdom uh, taken into exile by the Assyrians. There, uh, they go into exile because of their sinfulness. So to come out of exile means that God will deal with their sinfulness. This is why we get language of a new heart, a new spirit, um, a redemption. And, and then uh, whatever God does is going to make it possible now for these Israelites coming out of ex exile to obey his law, his statutes, and his words. Let's read these passages. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, 
and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. And then the Isaiah 59 passage comes right at the end of the chapter. It's uh, a couple verses, verses 20 to 21, that appear uh, right in the middle of a section that's difficult to break up. Uh, chapter 60 just flows so well on from chapter 59. Um, and chapter 58, the chapter about what kind of fasting God requires of his people, um, also uh, should be understood as part of the context because God is calling his people to live a different life, uh, diff to, to be righteous. And their understanding of their righteousness is inadequate, we learn in chapter 58. Their sinfulness is described in great detail in the beginning of chapter 59. And so finally we get to these verses that uh, offer this hope of God restoring Israel uh, from their, you might say, exile in their sins. And he will come to Zion as redeemer to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouths of your children or out of the mouths of your children's children, says the Lord, from now on and forever. The coming of the kingdom meant three things. We can describe it historically on the one hand or theologically on the other. And when we describe it historically, it's also a narrative. It's a progressive progression of events that are related to one another. I'm going to describe this coming of the kingdom then in terms of uh, this restoration from exile. And uh, to do that, let's use the words return, restoration, and reconciliation. If we talk about return, the uh, idea is, as we've been saying, the return of Israel from exile. Now, we can express that theologically without any reference to a story or a history, simply by using terms like repentance and redemption from sin. Typically, that's how we speak as Christians. We talk about needing to repent of our sins. We talk about how God has bought us back or redeemed us. Uh, but that uh, very personal language has its origin in the narrative of the restoration of Israel from exile. Uh, secondly, there is the term restoration. Here, again, we can present this in historical or narrative terms, the defeat of Israel's enemies and her being a blessing to the nations. Um, Israel uh, should have been a blessing to the nations and they should have been a blessing to the nations because of their righteousness. That kind of picture is especially uh, poignantly presented in Isaiah chapter 2, where Israel is pictured as a city that is on a hill and the nations are streaming to, the, to Mount Zion to learn righteousness from the Israelites. Quite to the contrary, though, Israel's sinfulness has been the story of the history of Israel. And so they have gone into captivity, not fulfilling uh, the mission that God had set for them to be a blessing to the nations. Now, that kind of description of uh, Israel uh, is, um, is uh, a description that God is going to reverse because when he re does restore them, uh, he will fight Israel's enemies and he will make her a blessing to the nations once again because sin has been dealt with in Israel. Theologically, that story can simply be presented as overcoming evil and the need to live righteously, having Christian ethics and so forth. But again, note that there is a narrative substructure to such theology. Thirdly, we can talk about reconciliation. It's a term that isn't found in the Old Testament. Although the language of peace 
or the imagery of lion, the lion lying down with the lamb and so forth is part of the Old Testament and for that matter in Isaiah. So uh, on the narrative historical side, uh, there is the idea that God will return to Zion. Uh, God and his people will be reconciled. Uh, Israel returns to Zion. God returns to Zion. In Ezekiel chapter 10, there is a picture of God's uh, presence, God's spirit, leaving the temple. And uh, just as God leaves the temple, so also the people are taken into exile in Ezekiel. But the resolution of that towards the end of uh, Ezekiel is that the people would return and God would return to Zion. That's the narrative side. Uh, theologically speaking, we can talk about the restoration of God's presence and reign among his people. Um, less of a narrative dimension to that. Now, N.T. Wright, uh, in his book, Jesus and the Victory of God, in 1993, uh, talked about the return from exile in three ways, too, slightly differently from the way I've presented it here. N.T. Wright said that the return from exile would mean, one, the return from exile itself of, of Israel, and then secondly, God dealing with sin, and thirdly, the return of Yahweh. So that's uh, quite similar to what I've presented here. Um, when he talks about the return of Yahweh, he also talks about the need f to rebuild the temple and uh, uh, relates that very well to Jesus' cleansing of the temple, that uh, part of Jesus' ministry would have required him to uh, restore um, the temple. Now, as we turn to um, some in-the-text passages, that is not what's behind Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their talking of the kingdom, but to uh, look at actual passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we will see that Jesus' teaching on the kingdom uh, is a teaching that the kingdom is already present on the one hand and that it is not yet present on the other. God's reign is already and it is not yet. The firstly, the nearness of the kingdom, Matthew four seventeen. Uh, we're going to look at these passages in the subsequent slides. The secondly, the presence of the kingdom. Uh, thirdly, the future of the kingdom. Fourthly, kingdom as realm and reign. Then we want to look specifically at a possibly problematic passage in Luke seventeen twenty one, and then. Sixthly, we want to return to the concept of the kingdom and talk about how it can be already and not yet. So Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew twelve twenty eight. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Matthew 6.10 Your kingdom come, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the passage in Luke 17.21 Nor will they say, look, here it is, that is the kingdom, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is, and this translation, NRSV, says, the kingdom of God is among you. King James had said, the kingdom of God is in you. So what are we to make of these passages? Jesus' message is encapsulated in Matthew 4.17 uh, as a message about the kingdom of heaven. Um, Matthew tends to use the language kingdom of heaven, whereas the other gospels tend to use the language kingdom of God. This is probably because uh, Matthew is a more in, in a more Jewish context is uh, tending to avoid the language of, that refers to God Himself. Uh, the danger of blaspheming God uh, created 
within the rhetoric of Israel, um, ways in which you could avoid saying God. Uh, you might say the voice from the throne, the voice from heaven. Um, I heard a voice. Uh, and then kingdom of heaven would be just another example of that. The Old Testament uh, in Hebrew will use names for God, but um, when it came time for the rabbis to add the vowels to the Hebrew, uh, which wasn't part of the original. In the original Hebrew Bible just had the consonants, um, and you would you would by knowing the language know what vowels should should be placed uh, in the between the consonants when you read the words. So when Hebrew um, came to add con add vowels, they created dots and lines underneath the consonants that were on the line. And so when they came to add the vowels for the name Yahweh, they didn't add the vowels uh, in the word that I just said, Yahweh. But what they did was they added other vowels for the word Adonai. In order not to say the name of God, that is the name Yahweh, they decided that they would say Adonai instead, which means simply Lord. And so... Um, if you add the vowels of the word Yahweh, uh, sorry, if you add the consonants to the word Yahweh and you add to them the vowels from the word Adonai, you get the word Jehovah, which is not an Old Testament word at all. Um, it's a creation out of two different words. Uh, when the Greek translation of the Old Testament was produced, in the second century BC, the translators avoided the name Yahweh altogether and simply used the Greek word for Lord, which is kurios. And so in your Old Testament English translations, if you see the word Lord in capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, behind that you know is the word Yahweh. If it isn't in capital letters, then you know that a word um, in, in the Hebrew is behind that, and that is uh, uh, Adonai, the word for Lord. So uh, that's a long explanation just to put you in the mindset of um, Israel and the Jews that would explain why kingdom of heaven kind of language would have been used. That may well be how Jesus spoke of it. Uh, whereas uh, in Mark and Luke, we do find the language kingdom of God. In the Matthew eleven twelve 12 passage, uh, we see that Jesus divides history in terms of the time up to John the Baptist and the time since John the Baptist. And what he's saying is that the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and violent people are trying to take it by force. I think that is the right interpretation of this passage. Um, it could have been translated as the kingdom of heaven uh, has been forcefully advancing, and some translations have that. Um, but I think that the idea is rather that it's really been under attack. Now, the important thing to note in, pa in Matthew eleven, twelve, is that what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom is here. In Matthew 4, 17, it's a bit ambiguous. He says the kingdom of heaven has come near. Does that mean it's almost here? Does it mean it's um, already here in part? Or how, how are we to understand that? So with Matthew eleven twelve, 12, we have a text that even more strongly suggests that the kingdom is present, although there is some kind of battle taking place because of the reign of God in their midst. Matthew 12, 28 has the same kind of idea. Uh, the kingdom of God has come to you, Jesus says. And the proof of that is that it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons. Now this language of spirit of God related to kingdom of God is quite important because we hardly find the language of kingdom of God in Paul's writings, but we find a lot about the spirit of God. And as we've already noted, the language of God's spirit 
is uh, present in um, Ezekiel 36 and in Isaiah 59. God's spirit is put in the people and that is related to the restoration of Israel from captivity. So the coming of the spirit, uh, it means that the power of God is present. And the power of God being present is another way of talking about the reign of God, which is another way of talking about the kingdom of God. So the language can vary, but the idea of God's rule, God's presence and his rule uh, can be captured in these different ways. Matthew 6.10 just assures us that there's also talk about uh, the coming of the kingdom in the future, as the disciples are told to pray. Now, Luke 17.21 says, don't go around saying, look here or there, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. The Greek word entos is here translated as among. It typically means in, in you, but it can be translated as among. Um, context has to determine what the best way to translate this word is. And if you think of a circle of people, you can say that there is something in the circle, or you can say there's something among the people in the circle. So you can see how the idea, the concept of in and among are related. Well, the same Greek word could mean both. Now, why would we not say the kingdom of God is in you? If we go that route, we have a couple problems. One is there's no other passage that understands the kingdom as somehow uh, personally within somebody. Um, we can find language like the Spirit of God is in you. So there is that related idea. But the idea of the kingdom is, is God's reign coming in the world. Um, it's, not, it's not so personalized as kingdom in you. And then secondly, the audience, the direct audience in Luke 17 uh, is the Pharisees. And how likely is it that Jesus would have said to them, his opponents in the gospel, uh, how is, likely is it he would say to them, the kingdom of God is in you? So Luke 17, 21 is rightly translated here in the NRSV as among the kingdom of God is among you. But also note that this verse too captures the idea that the kingdom is present in Jesus' ministry. Now, Jewish eschatology talked about two ages, and this especially comes out in what we call the intertestamental or second temple period of Judaism. Um, this age, uh, Olam Hazeh in Hebrew, and the age to come, Olam Habo. And what would distinguish the two ages? Well, there's quite the contrast. Uh, this age is an age of sin, an age of uh, following the law and having to tell each other, as we read in Jeremiah, um, uh, know the Lord. Uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a law that you see externally and you read and you study. Um, and over against that, we have a righteousness that comes uh, in the age to come that is a righteousness that springs from the Spirit of God indwelling God's people. So they don't have to, to say it to each other. They don't have to read it. They will just know what is right to do. And now, uh, this age is also characterized in terms of suffering, in terms of death, in terms of the, the rule of demonic powers, in terms of the sinful kings of Israel and Israel going into exile because of her sin and Israel being subjugated to the Gentiles. And it is a time of idolatry of the nations as well as idolatry within Israel. And over against that, the age to come would be characterized furthermore as uh, peace and paradise. Um, no more suffering, no more death. In fact, there would be uh, a resurrection that initiated the age to come uh, when the dead would rise. Uh, God would reign among his people. The Messiah would come to usher in this age. And Israel would return, as we've been saying, from exile. And when Israel is restored, so too the Gentiles now 
come to Zion. They give up their idolatry. They seek righteousness in Zion. And the glory of the uh, the glory of God is known throughout the whole earth. So in Jewish eschatology, we have the contrast of this age and the age to come. Christian eschatology amends that view slightly. And what I've done is I've shown an overlap of the ages, the already not yet. Uh, what inaugurates the age to come is the coming of Christ and the cross. What will bring this age to a conclusion will be the second coming of Christ on the clouds. And in the intermediate part, uh, we have uh, the uh, presence of God through his spirit in the church. So we could ask questions like, has sin been dealt with and righteousness restored? And of course, the answer is yes and no. Has the resurrection happened? Yes, Jesus has been raised from the dead. No, we have not yet been raised from the dead. Has God's reign come? Yes and no. Has the Messiah come? Well, he's come and he's coming again. Has Israel been restored from exile? Well, yes, uh, Jesus' ministry was a ministry to restore Israel. And yet the Jews reject Jesus. And so there's a sense in which that hasn't been fulfilled. There are... Uh, passages in the New Testament that suggest that there is a future restoration of the Jews. There's no discussion of Israel being restored as a nation in the New Testament um, or in the land. Um, so a lot of uh, Christian teaching about Israel being reconstituted in Israel today, the Jews being reconstituted in Israel today, is a lot of speculation based on certain ways to read the Old Testament passages. But there's nothing in the New Testament that suggests that. However, there are passages like Matthew uh, 23, verse 39, where Jesus leaves Jerusalem uh, in judgment and says, um, I will not come to you until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's some hope there that indeed they will. And then the famous passage in, Ma in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and following, uh, to many uh, are, are uh, Paul's view of a coming future time, a future time when Israel will be restored um, to God, not restored in the nation, not restored in the land necessarily, but restored to God. Have the Gentiles come to Zion? Uh, have they become righteous? Well, we see a church that is mostly Gentile today, and yet uh, the church is not a church without spot or wrinkle. And then has God's glory been revealed to the earth? Well, yes, in many, many ways in the history of the church and the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. And yet we all know that there is not um, a, a complete fulfillment in that. The final question on this slide is, has the Spirit been given? Has the Spirit been given? And in answer to that question, we uh, are not going to say already not yet. Uh, the teaching in the New Testament is that the coming of the Spirit means the coming of the kingdom. And there is not some future more full uh, coming of the Spirit. Uh, we find some passages like in Ephesians and, and uh uh, first and second Corinthians that are worth reading around this from Paul, if we can look ahead, where he talks about the deposit and the seal of the Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, we read, In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, the pledge of our inheritance. In other words, there is something future, but the Spirit's being given to the people is the pledge itself of what is future, the future inheritance. Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. The day of redemption is future. But the giving of the Spirit is a marking um, that is already present. 
1 Corinthians 1.22, we read, By putting his seal on us and giving us his spirit in our hearts as a first installment. In 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Now, the authority of the Son of David, uh, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the authority of the Son of Man, is uh, related to this idea of the coming of the kingdom. If kingdom means the reign and rule of God, then Jesus, uh, the Messiah, the Son of David, Jesus the Lord, Jesus the Son of Man, is the one who has this kingdom authority and brings it in his ministry. So Jesus' authority as son of David uh, in Matthew 20 is uh, pictured as an authority that he has to cleanse the temple. Uh, his authority is an authority uh, that allows him to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, it is an authority that um, was already recognized, Matthew 20, verse 30, by the uh, two blind men in Jericho when they call on the Son of David to have mercy on them, and he heals them. And so Jesus' authority as Son of David is established um, in, in Matthew 20, verse 30, and following right into chapter 21. So by the time that he has cleansed the temple in Matthew 21, uh, his authority is now questioned by the rulers of Jerusalem. And uh, the whole next few stories in Matthew's gospel are going to be stories surrounding the question of Jesus' authority. Can he answer the questions that the religious authorities put to him in Jerusalem? Who is he? What right does he have to do and say what he's saying? And that those stories conclude with Jesus asking all these leaders a question. It has to do with his authority. He says, um, whose son is the son of David? And uh, whose son is the Messiah, rather? And they say, well, it's the son of David. And Jesus says, well, then why does David call him Lord? with reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. So that introduces a new title. We move from Son of David authority to Lord authority, which is a higher kind of way of talking about Jesus' authority. And related to that, we find in Matthew 24 and 25 and other parts of the Gospels, the idea that Jesus has authority because he is the Son of Man. We will talk about this title in a more complete way at another point. But Matthew 25, 31 and 30 to 34 uh, says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and then all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left, then the king will say to those at his right hand, and so forth, the authority of the Son of Man to bring judgment, just as we find in Daniel chapter 7, where the son of, one like a Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days on his throne and is given authority um, that he then takes to, to the earth uh, in, in the ministry that he has in Daniel 7. So too, Jesus fulfills that authority from heaven um, in, in uh, his ministry. In conclusion, let's look at a few of the points that we've been making in this ever so brief lecture on the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. First of all, we've noted that kingdom is to be understood in a narrative way. We could look at kingdom in terms of specific texts and say, oh yes, look, the idea or the theme is present in the Old Testament that God is king and that Israel is the people in the kingdom of God. There are many texts that we could look at for that. And 
especially in Daniel and especially in uh, passages in the Psalms. But this lecture is emphasized that kingdom is to be understood in a narrative sense. And for that, we've turned particularly to the prophets, prophets like Isaiah, and said that that narrative is a narrative of return, restoration, and reconciliation for Israel. And if it is that for Israel, as we see in the prophets, it is also that now for the nations. God is going to resolve the story's problem, not only for Israel, but for all peoples of the earth. So, uh, closely attached to this idea of kingdom is the historical event of the exile and return from exile of Israel. Secondly, the kingdom of God is tied to the idea of new covenant. The new covenant righteousness of God's people coming out of exile. They don't simply come out of exile. They don't simply change their status. But they actually change who they are. God will put a new spirit in them. They will have a changed heart. God's words will be put into their mouths. Thirdly, we've seen that kingdom is not so much a matter of realm. That was one of the issues that the Jews uh, had with Jesus. Where is his kingdom? He's not acting like a king taking over a throne in a capital city like Jerusalem. And yet, Jesus came proclaiming the coming of the kingdom. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And what he meant, another way to put it, is the kingdom is primarily a matter of the reign or power and authority of God. It is not so much a matter of worldly powers with their armies and so on. If that's true then the kingdom can be already and not yet. You can have the authority of a power, and yet the realm has not yet been established. Scholars in the 20th century found uh, a particularly helpful uh, an image from Oscar Kuhlman about this. Kuhlman likened this idea of an already not yet kingdom to uh, events at, toward the end of the Second World War, the events of D-Day and VE Day. D-Day was when the Allies landed in Normandy, and once they had a foothold in Europe, it was inevitable that they would eventually win the war. But still, there was time of fighting before Victory in Europe Day, VE Day, when the Allies uh, took over Berlin and Hitler committed suicide and the war was over. And between those two times of D-Day and VE Day, there was much fighting. The Battle of the Bulge uh, took place, for example, where many people lost their lives. Yet the authority and reign of the Allies was beginning to be felt in places like France and Belgium and so forth. Now we need to find other ways to express this uh, in our day and age. Uh, people think of the Second World War like uh, some of us older people think of the Civil War. And we're trying to remember our history on that. So uh, some people might refer to uh, the uh, events of an engagement and the actual wedding in terms of already not yet. And uh, another way that I found when I was teaching in Ethiopia was to talk about what happens to the water in the Nile as the Nile uh, approached the Mediterranean Sea. About 100 miles before the Nile River actually gets to the Mediterranean Sea, one begin, can begin to taste salt in the water. And so with the coming of Jesus already the saltiness of the kingdom is being tasted as we inevitably approach 
the Mediterranean. And so, uh, finally then, we can understand the relationship of kingdom and Jesus' kingdom proclamation to the authority of Jesus. Jesus does not simply come announcing the kingdom. Jesus comes bringing the kingdom. Jesus brings the kingdom in what he says and what he does. And he brings the kingdom particularly in his work on the cross and his resurrection. And so in these ways then, uh, we can understand many of the kingdom passages in the Gospels. Now just before I conclude this lecture, I would uh, suggest to you, with respect to New Testament theology, that this understanding of kingdom helps us understand the relationship between Jesus and Paul. One of the questions that was frequently asked in classrooms of, in the 20th century was, what does the proclaimer, Jesus, have to do with the proclaimed, uh, the gospel? What does the proclaimer, who came himself proclaiming the kingdom, have to do with the gospel in Paul that is all about Jesus himself? Just stating that again. What is the relationship between the message of the kingdom in the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and the message of Paul in the Gospel of, about Jesus Christ? And so we can see that with these points about Jesus as the um, one who inaugurates the kingdom in his own authority, in his own ministry, that there is a relationship between what he was proclaiming and who he was.